Hello and welcome to Leo Seisei's Pantheon, a new fortnightly podcast with me, your host, Leo Seisei. Today we'll be interviewing John Cunliffe, a veteran children's book writer and creator of such characters such as Postman Pat and Rosie and Jim. John has been writing for almost 40 years and was previously a primary school teacher and mobile librarian. John, welcome to the show. Thank you, Leo. Thank you very much. So, was that a sufficient intro for you, John? Yes, yes, I, I think you've uh, covered all bases there. Yes, it's true. I did work for many years as a mobile librarian and also as a teacher, and I'm now um, a full-time writer. Uh, my first book, uh, Farmer, Farmer Barnes uh, Buys a Pig, uh, was published in 1963, uh, but uh, I'm best known for... Um, widely known for a uh, hugely popular characters, uh, Postman Pat and uh, Rosie and Jim. And uh, I've published over uh, 190 books for young children, including five volumes of poetry as well as numerous picture books and a collection of short stories. So you've actually got a really extensive career there that goes back a long way. And I didn't realise your first book, Farmer Barnes, was actually published in, did you say, 1964? That's right, yes. So your career actually goes way beyond 40 years. Oh, yes. <laughs> right, okay. So, John, I guess first question is, as, as a writer, primarily for children's books and what later became TV shows at Post with Pat, Rosie and Jim, where do you tend to draw your inspirations from? Well, I, I, I grew up in uh, lots of farming communities and villages. Um, I, I've, I've lived in Kendall for most of my life and also I'm um, about a bit in Windermere and also around Northumberland in the North East. Um, so I think my setting and where I was writing at the time fed into a lot of, fed into the stories that I was writing. So the area so, around Kendall and the farming communities, they were a big influence for you? Yes, yes, I'd say so. Um, and my... Was that, what was that? Was that supposed to be feedback on your end? Don't worry, John, it's okay. It's just the microphone. Oh, no. Can you hear me? Is everything all right? Is, I can hear you. You still hear me? Yeah. clear, yes? Yeah, yes. please continue. Yeah. Right. Yes, so... so Yes, like I say, I, I, I've lived about in Kendall and in Northumberland, and um, yes, I think uh, living in those communities and those parts of the country fed into the characters and the stories and the narratives I've written uh, throughout uh, most of my extensive career as a writer and a novelist. I think being a writer, it's important to take influence from your surroundings. And I think that's quite common with most writers, is that you write about what you know. Mm. Mm. You, you'll find that with a lot of authors will actually say a similar thing. So John, as a self-described avid reader, what are some of your favourite authors and books? Yes, that's, that's a very good question. Um, I do admire the work of um, Dickens, of course. Um, okay. My favourite of his is Christmas Carol, which is such a lovely, such a lovely I do enjoy it. I think it's a great deal of fun. Um, I do, I do quite like the works of Oscar Wilde, though he was more of a playwright. Um, but I do appreciate his work as an artist and as a writer. It's interesting because the two authors you've just chosen are obviously from sort of the nineteenth-century Victorian era. Is that is that important with your influence on your writing at all? No, no, I just, um, I just, I think it's good to have an admiration for the greats, you know. Okay. I mean, I, I do, I do have, I do have um, a lot of uh, books at home, um, a lot by um, uh, H. Rod Haggard and um, Sax Roman, and there's some that I um, find, uh, I have a great deal of fun when I'm reading those books. And of course, the normal Hunter books, um, and the Biggles books, of course, they're, they're, big, they're a big inspiration for my, my writing, actually, the Biggles books. Um, I don't know if you've read them yourself. but I haven't um, read the Biggles books, no. Uh, they've got a great deal of fun. I do think you'd enjoy them. Give, it a, give them a go if you get the chance. What, what about them do you particularly enjoy? The thing I enjoyed most about them is that they were aimed at children. 
And I do find that the sort of adventure feel that you get from it, it's, it's effectively the first adventure book, isn't it? It was, it was one of the first adventure books, and I think it was because it was so widely accessible at the time um, that made it um, more interesting for people of my age at the time. See, because they came, they were published um, when I was, you know, just a little boy. So they, in, in a way, they do remind me of my life growing up as a boy pre. Um, Second World War, which mm-hmm. which also had you know, I wouldn't say had a great impact on my writing as a writer, but certainly on my life as a young adult growing up in this industry. Um, so the Biggles books were actually published when you were you were a young person yourself. That's right. Yes. Uh, you, you described them as probably some of the first adventure books, but um, uh, you see, I'm, I'm just thinking about right, you know, Journey to the Center of the Earth, for example, which were really important adventure books at the time. But also things about uh, Greek never, mythology. Never heard of, Sorry, never heard of, no, I've never heard of them. You've never heard of them? No. Okay. Right. Um, I was just thinking about the the mythology of things, you know, such as Greek mythology, where you'd have the hero's journey and Odysseus, uh, the twelve labors of Hercules. Did these not serve as an inspiration for you? Did you ever take an interest in? I'm just thinking about your interest in adventure. The thing with um, the Greek mythology. As fascinating as it is, and I do appreciate what the Greeks were trying to do at the time, of course when they produced these stories, um, well, I, don't, I don't suppose they had a publishing firm to produce those stories for. Well, no, no. And, but, um, well, I think they served as um, a sort of leeway for them to um, express their creative minds. Um, so in a way, the way I look at them is that they're not really books at all, and the Biggles books were the first adventure books because they were so badly accessible to people of all ages, especially young children like myself at the time. Okay, so you're, you're absolutely adamant that the Biggles books were seminal in adventure literature? I, I think so, and it's not just because I have an emotional attachment to them. Okay. So, should we move on to the next question? With that, so, yes, please. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, Postman Pat is an incredibly popular children's character now, and you could say a global icon in many ways. Oh uh, yeah. What was your experience in having one of your creations turned into a TV show? Oh, it was it was amazing. I mean, you know, when they asked me to um, do the pilot and um, wanted me to write an outline uh, for 13 episodes of Please Call Children. And, um, you know, that's all they told me. There was no other specifications other than that. Um, that it was a Please Call Children and that it was set in the countryside. Now, when I was writing those books, um, I was actually, that was the time when I was a mobile librarian in Northumberland. And so... Um, a lot of that uh, fed into um, the writing that I was um, doing at the time when I was drafting those books. And of course, you know, when I write, when I wrote uh, the uh, the outline for the episodes, um, uh, my my, my um, uh, publishers at the, uh, the the publishing firm said to me, "For once, they've asked a writer to write um, a series." And, and they hadn't interfered because, you know, they produced it exactly as I wrote it. And I think that's quite special. I do I do think so. I do think you'd have a great deal of fun with it. So it sounds like, yeah, it's really exciting for you to actually have your integrity as a writer really respected in that sense and not steamrolled over as often you will get with TV or cinema, for example, where the writer's work is almost bastardised. Yes, of course. Well, that's putting it quite strongly, but yes, of course. They, well, I mean, they said to me, just write stories, you know. Don't worry. Don't worry about how they're doing it. You just write the stories. And, um, you know, they said, 
uh, it, nothing may come of it. Um, many, many things don't, um, but, but we just hope. And uh, thankfully, yes, it, I think it did pay off, um, over, over, pay, over exceeded its um, expectations of us and uh, the producers and, of course, um, uh, Mr. Wood at the, um, at the studios, the animator. Um, I do think as well that creating a show that was set in the countryside um, was a breath of fresh air to a lot of young children. Because of course, a lot of a lot of kids um, um, in those times uh, were brought up in a, a sort of uh, metropolitan households, so it was great deal of fun just to, just you know delve into um, that 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 side of the world where where I where I grew up and where I um, uh, was uh, settled when I was writing those books at the time. Okay, so uh, I don't know if you know much about the whole idea of Leo Seisei's, but it has, I guess, more archaic pagan leanings in some ways. And I like what you just said there, because it's the idea of bringing something a bit more nature-based to a culture which has become very industrialised and metropolitan in many ways. And that, that, that was a big motivation for you, was it? Oh, ah, yes, I, I believe so. I don't want to. Um, I don't want to put too much of a label on it. I don't want to look into it too no. much. But um, from that point of view, yes, I, I, th I think I might have to agree with you. Okay. So I guess what what interest did you have as a child, John? You've already mentioned the Biggles box, but well. Um, my parents um, did always encourage me to um, to read. And of course, I'm thinking about fed in, of course, fed into um, the um, my passion for reading and writing uh, now, um, and my aspirations to become um, a novelist and writer. Were you um, writing as a child as well then? No, no, just um, just reading. Um, admittedly, I didn't actually pick up a book until I was about seven years old. Okay. Um, I suppose what what else I was doing. Well, what do what do children do now? I suppose. Well, I suppose they sit in their computer games and their game stations. But um, you know, I think as well. Um, there is there seems to be a resurgence of children um, sort of going back to basics, or at least their parents um, giving them the facilities to go back to basics. So you know, there's. Um, we did the, uh, me and my friends, we would do the hopscotch and, um, you know, we had a sort of little wooden toys of little uh, model trains, um, not the electric ones, of course, but, um, you know, they, they, they served, uh, they, they served as a great deal of fun at the time. And um, I, I, I do look back with very fun memories on those days. I was um, a war child. Um, and I find that very difficult to talk about, to be honest. Um, I did witness uh, the, the, the whole the whole picture, um, and it's very it's a very frightening time. It's really a great deal of horrible things happened. Um, I did lose family members, unfortunately, aunties and uncles and the like. Um, um, and we were we were evacuated to no, um, to um, uh, Kimberley at the time, um, and it was. Um, it was oh, it's very, just a very dark time man, for, for, for anyone who had to live through that, of course. You just said you were evacuated to Kimberley. Is that in Nottingham? Did I say... No, I'm, I'm in Windermere. No, no, Kimberley's where my grand grew up. Sorry, yes? The, uh, well, the war was traumatic for so many people. It sounds like it was a really difficult time for you as a child to be living through that. But some of oh. these toys and games that you're describing were beneficial for you to have a childhood yes 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 it was it was very it was very minimal it was very minimalist it was very minimal well, um, you, you mentioned that and you'd mentioned that there's a bit of a resurgence of, yeah, of parents facilitating something more minimal for children nowadays could you just go into a bit more detail about that well i i don't have children myself but um, I would say that perhaps it's becoming apparent, at least on the news, when I look at BBC or when I read the newspaper, 
and um, you get a lot of mom, mothers and fathers saying that um, oh my my son's always on his computer game or oh my daughter's always always doing her hair in front of the mirror and you know it's just it's just a little bit um i think when i think it's becoming it's being acknowledged by parents that um in this uh, sort of technological age that we live in that all of these great gifts that we can get because a lot of kids are spoiled rotten a lot of kids are spoiled rotten so i would say that um yes we, that, that's being acknowledged and um, that, that they are explored rotten and some kids anyway some children of course not all not all um and yes um what 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 does how does this connect up with the idea of people returning to a more minimal kind of childhood away from technology well perhaps i have to be quite honest i've only seen it um in the communities that i'm living in at the moment um see i i'm i'm, I'm living i am living in cumbria um um in in um in kendall um and there are a lot of i do see a lot of skipping ropes and a lot of sort of i don't see children with mobile phones you don't see children yeah. with mobile phones in cumbria no no i don't think so and i'm going to take i'm going to take the benefit of the doubt and assume that perhaps um young children and toddlers all over the country don't necessarily need their mobile phones to have to have a good time. You know, they could climb trees and go down to the, the river and throw stones with chipper, perhaps. Or, you know, just things that young children would get up to. Okay. Oh, read, I, I would encourage them to read. I think that thing would be a great deal of fun if there's a lot of young children but to uh, read um because that's what my parents encouraged me to do and um, i must admit i'm glad that i did because it um it really gave me a sort of a leaning into what i what's this title of doing and of course as you well know um, it is writing and reading as well yes you are a writer and that encouragement helped to build the way towards your future career that's right so john you, whilst working on Rosie and Jim, which is a TV show that you, you did write part of that, didn't you? But you also presented it. John, That's right. as a character, was on Rosie and Jim, the TV show. Right. Did, did you actually live on a barge? Or have you ever lived on a barge in your life? Well, I did live on a barge um, for a time. Um, it was only temporary. Probably about, um, it must have been about 18 months, 18 months to two years. And it was between, um, it was between a time um, when me and my wife, um, Sylvia, had separated. Me, me, me and my wife, Sylvia, we, we've, been, we've been together since we were 15, you know. So um, we're having a bit of um, a wobble, and so we decided, oh, that I would um, do the honourable thing and uh, give her some space. So I moved into the to the barge, into the boat, and uh, I mean it was great fun because you know you get you get to you get to go wherever you want really, don't you? And so it it's um, it provided a lot of inspiration for me to want to write something based on um, my settings mm -hmm. once again. Which, which of course is where um, what I'm most familiar with, um, as I previously said um, in the interview. Well, um, you said that you write, you write what you know as an author, so that's yes, a big sir. part of your experience at the time. But you, you were to use that as the basis for Rosie and Jim. Yes, of course. I mean, I had, I had had ideas about um, this program um, and where it could go. Um, but I didn't want it to be too much of a rehash of Pat, you see. So, in a way, what happened to me moving um, me and Sylvia separating was a blessing in disguise because it gave me um, the idea to set Rosie and Jim 
on a um, on a barge on a canal boat so there's that that constant feeling of movement and that feeling of adventure and i really love that i think that's a really great idea and i think it really worked for the show how was it building the idea for rosie and jim around a period in your life where actually sounds quite difficult because you were separated from your wife during that time and the, the premise of Rosie and Jim essentially is that John, as the character, lives on his own on the barge. He seems like quite a lonely chap, actually, that he, he's using these two rag dolls as company. Did Rosie and Jim actually exist in real life during that time for you? You mean as in my, as the character that I designed devised for the books or do you mean um well did you actually have two rag dolls called rosie and jim that served as inspiration oh, for the characters no 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 they, they were characters thought up by myself and um funnily enough by sylvia um this is this is pre uh, wobble as um, i would put it um see my wife sylvia um is a teacher as well um and she did a lot of teaching in malawi for a period um, so she did a lot of, um, she taught a lot of children, uh, she did a lot of different subjects and it was, um, you know, a big adventure for her. But um, she befriended this um, a little girl called Rosie. Um, I've never met a Rosie myself, but I've seen some lovely pictures of her and Sylvia and she looked like a lovely, a lovely little girl. Um, and so what the about, inspiration what about for Rosie, Rosie... What about Rosie? inspired you to create a character? I heard so many interesting stories about Rosie. She was one of Sylvia's star pupils, you see, and she was she was never afraid to put her hand up and answer a question. So, um, and of course, as, as a, a former um, teacher myself, um, I, in a way, I sympathise with that because um, children can be a little bit ambiguous and a bit vague in classes um, and it does make it difficult for a teacher to try and you know get the flow going when children are willing to engage and Rosie was always willing to engage I found that really I found that so inspiring and she was a, she was a cheeky little devil as well apparently she'd always play tricks on the other kids and sometimes on Sylvia but Sylvia just took it in her stride and you know the, 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 there was never any bad blood between the two of them it's interesting that you're so inspired by somebody so young who you've never actually met. Yes, well, in in a way, I mean, Sylvia spent a lot of time with uh, Rosie, um, and um, it made more sense if it said that Sylvia served as a sort of motherly figure to Rosie, because Rosie's parents um, weren't particularly um, always available, you know. Um, what with the, um, the, 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 the the climate and the the, uh, the health conditions, of course. Um, I don't think Rose's dad was there, and her mum was very poorly. Her mum was very poorly, so Sylvia provided that love and care and attention that I think young Rosie was craving. Mm. Um, I'd be quite interested to see how Rose is doing now, to be honest, because that was about 25 years ago. I'm wondering, that earlier you mentioned that you've never had children yourself, if there's something about Rosie that symbolised the child you never had. Oh, oh you're going to... Oh, that's, um, yes, I, th I think that is true, in a way. Um, I am very fond of young Rosie, but, um, well, of course she's not young anymore, she's all grown up, but, um, yes, um, she's um, she does serve as a sort of... Um, I thought that role because uh, me and Sylvia, yes, you're right, we never did have children. John, it always seemed that you had hippie leanings and it was revealed in Rosie and Jim that you were a vegetarian. You've always had a long beard and the idea of living on a barge is symbolic of an outsider's life, which many hippies are attracted to. Were you a hippie back in the day? No, no, I wasn't. And I'm not interested in the hippie culture or the hippie era. I have no time for it. Uh, I think it's a waste of time. And I don't want to be aggressive per se, but I do think there are a bunch of good-for-nothing freeloaders and they need a bloody good wash.
Well, it sounds like you've got really strong feelings against hippies, Bill. No, 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 not strong, just stern. I know my feelings towards them, and I'll keep it that way. And it's been that way for 40 years. Okay. It I believe is. in I believe in education, and I believe in teaching your children to have respect for one another. And I think going to, you know, lie in a field with your genitals hanging out um, and smoking God knows what is not going to answer the world's problems. So I stand by it. And Sylvie is the same. We've we've spoken about it and we've agreed that, you know, you do what you like and I don't think you should be chastised for it, but it doesn't mean I have to like it. Oh, I've got myself into a, a bit of a bit of a sausage. <laughs> oh, what? Well, I mean... No, I, I don't think anyone should ever feel um, shame about um, who they are. Um, but I do think that we should um, keep a distance from certain things, just to maintain a sort of um, a sort of um, a light that we are accustomed to, rather than too much change. If that makes sense. Could you elaborate? Well, there's a lot of there's a lot of different things going on in the world at the moment, and it's all changed so fast. It's all changed so fast. It's all it's all it's all um it's like a tree that hasn't had years to grow, but rather it's had weeks, you know. Um, and so what I think is, um, with of course the um, te the technologic technological advancements that have happened in the past fifteen twenty years. Um, that's one aspect in itself, but it does feel like um, a lot of people are becoming a little more self-aware and are questioning things a little bit more. And I do find it very strange because I'm from a time when we, you know, we we, we looked up to our leaders and we loved our leaders. It was, it was truly, you know, we were proud to say this is my prime minister and they're going to get the job done, you know. So actually, the whole idea of hippies. And the counterculture movement that was moving away from that kind of respect for unjustified authority wouldn't have fitted in with your values. Well, if you put it like that, no. But um, like I say, I don't think anyone should be ever be afraid um, to be what they want to be. You know. Um, what if the I authority like, in charge well, I, I like, doesn't pardon? want that? What if the authority in charge, which you say that we should be respecting, doesn't want us to be who we want to be, but be who they want us to be? Oh, well, that's, um, that would be a little bit like what Mussolini was doing, and um, of course Adolf Hitler. Um, I would have wanted to live in a world like that, that's for sure. So, I think if we could all just get along, that would be a lot easier. Okay. Okay. John, you've always worn fantastic looking jumpers. And Rosie and Jim, you, oh, you, your you. jumpers were, yeah. Where do you get your jumpers from? My jumpers, well, a lot of them are hand me downs from my, my father and my grandfather, funnily enough. Um, you know, the, the style tends not to change um, with those sorts of things. But um, I do get a lot of things second-hand as well. And I have treated myself to some uh, first-hand um, jumpers before. Um, from, you know, Marks and Spencers or perhaps, um, um, you know, from um, Heron Foods, if they've got any in. Sometimes they've got some interesting clothes. Um, but uh, no, a lot of them, I must say, are hand-me-downs. Okay. So a lot of the jumpers that you actually wear today are hand-me-downs from your dad and your granddad. I do have a couple, yes. That are, there are admittedly some that have stains and holes. Uh, they need to get the sewing machine on them or something. But um, yes, I like I say, I have bought a lot of my um, clothing and attire um, from second-hand shops, and you get some fantastic deals. You know, you get some really great deals at second-hand shops, don't you, these days? I've got a pair of lovely 
uh, star press um, uh, slacks um, for three pounds fifty. Uh, back in the sixties, they would have cost you about fifty pounds ish. You know, um, the equivalent of what would have been fifty pounds today. Um, so it's amazing that they always can get to the charity shops nowadays. And of course, yes, my 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 jumpers. Um, you get get a really great deal sometimes two for one. Sometimes two for one on um, the um, the jumpers. Um, depending on what um, sale or the um, the second hand shop would have on, or perhaps some some second hand shops sometimes even have a one pound rail. And I do think that is really that's a great deal of fun because when you go into the shop and you see that one pound rail, you just think, oh my goodness. Well, I better go and get started. <laughs> I don't know if you do any second hand shopping yourself, but it's a great deal of fun. <clears throat> So going back to what you were saying earlier about the, you use the metaphor of the tree expanding out, that it's not had years to grow, but it's had weeks to grow, is your analogy about modern technology and the quickening pace of that. In recent years, you have actually dipped into new technologies. I'm thinking about your 2010 app Ghosts, which was an interactive children's book. How do you see technology further integrating itself into the world of literature? Well, I mean, I don't have, um, I don't have a computer. Um, my wife, um, Sylvie, she does have um, a laptop, um, but it's getting, it's getting quiet all now. It's one of those, um, one of those vistas, and um, you know, um, it's quite good. It's quite good, but. Um, it does overheat, and I do worry it's, it's going to set on fire or start smoking any minute, you know. So I do, I do worry about things like that. Um, but um, in terms of your question about adapting it to modern literature, I think I mean I was astonished when they um, released go um, Ghosts on the iPad. I I couldn't believe it. I thought, well, this is this is a new way of doing it, you know. And so, perhaps I'm not too um, in the know with what you know a mobile phone is coming out and so what what's new iPad um, version um, model is going to be released um, because they seem to be bringing out a new one every every six months it seems um, and I think that's just totally ridiculous. I don't, I don't know why they waste their money manufacturing all these products when they're all quite similar to the previous its predecessor. Do you, have, um, do you have an iPad? I know that you said you don't have a computer, but do you use a tablet or anything? So. Well, well, I do have the iPad, and when um, when I had put Ghosts um, together um, with the firm, um, they had given me an iPad for free um, right. as a sort of, um, I suppose, because in a way, Ghost is helping to advertise the um, the iPad. So I did get one, which was very, very kind of them, very generous. Okay. Um, and I do, I do have a look at it sometimes because you know you can uh, you can buy greenos on it, and um, you can do a uh, 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 television program. Uh, you can do all the things that you would do on a computer, but you can do it with freedom. You don't have to leave it plugged in, batteries on an all day, and it's just so easy to use. Um, I gave it to my wife, who's not really interested in computers, and it was difficult to get it back again, so I had to fight over um, who had it. Um, well, um, I chose a poem for my app um, for a very good reason. Um, it's very oh, talking about, is, is Ghost the poem? No, Ghost is the name of the app. Um, there's a lot of different poems that are in the app. Um, okay. I don't. I don't know if you can have you have access to it now. Um, it was about seven eight years ago when Ghosts was on the um, the, the the App Store. No, um, you, you can't get access to it now, uh, and I'm not sure that it was ever released on the Android mobile devices either. I think it was just for Apple. Right. Yes. You see, they're losing. They're losing a lot of the market there, aren't they? Because of course, half of the half of the population is going to have um, the um, the um, the phones that you said, the um, the ones that aren't the Apple ones. 
well, it's the the writers that will be losing out, such as yourself as well. Yes, exactly. That's what I'm saying. You know, that the missed out on a great deal of the market, so it's just a missed opportunity in a way, and perhaps um, even worse so um, for the children because that that you know that's effectively it's for who the app was made for, and if children can't have access to it, then we failed. It's failed as a product, um, and I do resent Star Life doing that. Really, is a shame because it was it had some fantastic illustrations by Joanne the Trout, and of course um, some really great, some really lovely, um, light-hearted, warm poems uh, written by myself. And, and is that a platform that you'd like to do more work on? Oh well, I would like to if I understood it more. Um, I did have to get the um, the publishers to explain exactly what an iPad was. Um, when we went in for uh, the first uh, meeting, um, but um, yes, I think I would, I would be interested in um, doing more on the, the iPad. I think it requires interest and see if um, if Pat would take off on there, because of course he's the most popular character that I have. Well, I'm thinking about the recent post from Pat movie actually, which was completely recreated in computer generated graphics. What are your feelings about that and the direction that that took? Did you, did you have much input in that production? No, no. I got um, I got a cut of the um, what the uh, the money. There's the amount of tickets that they sold, the amount of viewings uh, from the public. Um, I got a cut from that, the sort of a commission, I think you'd call it. Right. Um, but I do think, um, as as far as I'm aware. Um, I haven't seen it since it was released, but they got rid of all of the original voice actors, and it's such a shame because they did such a terrific job, and they did it for so long as well. They did it for so long, and they all did such an amazing job. And of course, Ken, um, Ken Barry, who passed recently. I was just um, about to say, Ken Barry died recently. Yeah. Yes, and he said we, we 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 got on ever so well. We got on ever so well. He was he was such a good a good hearted man. You know, and then um, he was perfect for the role of Pat. Um, but um, I did enjoy the new film. I thought it was I thought it was very funny. Um, but it's I, I have to admit it did um, um, drop um, a lot of the ideas and the sort of raw essence that I had um, depicted and planned for Pat when I originally wrote the serial all those years ago. Well, the raw essence that you're sort of alluding to, I'm thinking about your original statement that a lot of the influences for your writing came from the farming communities that you grew up on, that it is more of an archaic lifestyle. So it's interesting that you're quite keen to integrate the, technolo the technology for your future writing, because one might assume that they're in conflict with each other, but actually I'm getting a sense that you, you're quite keen to integrate those things. I don't think you can avoid it, to be honest. I think of the way that things have gone, you've got to, uh, you've got to either you either stay um, on the desert island or you jump on the boat. So, and I would prefer to jump on the boat and move on and press on and try and move the times as much as I can. And uh, because I'm eight, I'm eight, I'm, eight, I'm, eight, I'm eight, nearly eighty-five now, and so. It's, um, I think, with um, the years, the time they have left, I would like to try and take a grip with what um, life has to offer, um, even if it means perhaps being quite frightened of what may, is, is to come um, in terms of, you know, um, being alien to technology, etc. Feel the fear and do it anyway. Oh, yes, yes, that's what that's what Sylvia said to me. <laughs> and and you you talk about jumping on a boat metaphorically, but could that be literally? Would you be jumping back on a barge any time soon again? Oh, uh, uh, for more episodes of Rosie and Jim. Well, that'd be that'd be the day, wouldn't it? Um, I I would be interested in doing more Rosie and Jim. Um. Unfortunately, I can't stand for very long now. Um, but um, the series, um, it did stop 
after Neil stopped presenting it. So it would be quite nice to see, um, just to do a, a couple more, maybe maybe a short series, maybe six episodes or something. And, and I think I think people would watch it. I think I think I think the uh, the, the children that did watch it um, in the uh, mid nineties when it was originally showing would be keen to watch it. And of course, um, the, most of those children would... would be in their twenties. 30s now do you think that Rosie and Jim has appeal to people in their 30s oh no uh, I'm sure not but perhaps to their own children um, you know they might say oh I, I used to watch this when I was um, when I was growing up and um, it was a great deal of fun I, re I really think you should give it a go and that's something that you'd like to perhaps go back to but adapt based on your age and the fact that you just said that you can't stand up for a long period of time anymore. There'd have to be, um, I think the producers would have to um, cater to my physical um, needs. So I would have to do a lot of sitting down and a lot of waiting. Um, but I think it could be done. I mean, I went to the premiere of the Post from Pat movie and I did stand up um, for a good couple of hours um, in between. Uh, periods of sitting down, um, but you know, I'm, I'm not as I'm not as frail as I may seem. Um, but I, I, I have to be truthful with myself. I, I can't. I do struggle to stand up um, for long periods. Well, John, it's been a really good interview, and I just get a sense that you're still as enthusiastic as ever, and onwards and upwards. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, is there, is there anything else that you'd like to ask? No, that's the end of my question. Is there anything else that you'd like to say? Well, um, no, just th thank you very much and uh, good luck with the rest of uh, your series. And I hope that we speak again soon. Thank you, John. I hope so too. Bye. I'll send you a love to Sylvia. Thank you. Goodbye. Good. Cheers. Cheers.